the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. Practical psychology for today. Featuring the works of Idris Shah, narrated by David Alt. Welcome to the Idris Shah Foundation podcast. This is the 16th in our series of selections made by the members of our Facebook group, and it comes from Oriental Magic and is the encounter with Akhil Khan, the alchemist. Akhil Khan was an alchemist. It is strange at first sight that a man who is thought to be able to make all the gold he wants should live in a cave. The explanation, like the sugar cake the child saves at a party, comes last. At first, with a Western mentality of judging by externals, one does not feel like placing too much reliance on Akhil. Tall, of that wiry Pathan race so well known in the Khyber, he was thin, bearded, turbaned, and the colour of mahogany. Clad in a pair of not-so-near-white tight-fitting trousers and an old army tunic, he is a man of few words. Our mutual friend Ahmed explained that he had brought a very important friend from England to visit Akhil Khan, and to learn his wisdom of the making of gold. Neither of these pieces of information had the power to unfreeze the immobility of Akhil, or even, it seemed, to interest him. He shrugged his shoulders, pursed his lips, please yourself. The first requisite was to have a bath and change into clean clothes. The other requirement, if Akhil's example was any indication, was silence. Ahmed and I stood outside the cave until Akhil appeared. In silence, he handed an empty, ordinary pint bottle to each of us and strode off. We brought up the rear. It was a hot day, and we were thankful when he struck off into the shade of the jungle. We had tramped for a couple of miles, crossed a fence and the railway lines, and plunged once more into the trees. Akhil halted after another two miles. Here were a few plants like tall dandelions. We watched the alchemist break the stems and collect the few drops of milky juice from each into his bottle. It was a slow business, and we soon understood that he expected us to do the same. For the next two hours we wandered about collecting the thickening juice, hands sticky and mouths parched. The two of us had collected by this time about a quarter of a pint of the juice. Akhil approached, took our bottles and added their contents to his. Then we started back. Nothing was said about thirst. When we washed in the spring near his cave, I tried to take a sip of water. Akhil shook his head violently. Clearly he was a man of the most Spartan habits. This seemed, however, a part of the ritual. As we were not being told anything, it behoved us we who were going to buy London before long, to observe and learn this thing. After sitting for a few minutes, apparently in contemplation, Akhil signed to us to go home. Ahmed told me that he had heard that alchemists do not speak during their work, because the spirits which guard gold must not know that there is gold making afoot. The next day we went at dawn to the cave, he was waiting and led us off in the opposite direction from that which we had previously taken. Three hours of walking in the jungle brought us to a clearing. Through this ran a small stream of icy water. The ground on either side was moist and the colour of mustard. Akhil proceeded to collect mud just below the surface, where it was a creamy yellow. We took about two pounds each, and the whole was amalgamated into one large round ball and carried back in a knotted cloth. During all this time there had been no word from Akhil and no audible sign of any magical utterances on his part. Back in the cave we watched Akhil make two deep bowls from the yellow clay, each one about six inches in diameter. These were put on a ledge to dry and we were again dismissed. The next day there was a long hike to collect wood, although there were quantities quite near the cave. 
I noticed that it was all hard, dark brown wood, though of different types of tree. The next day we had to visit a stone quarry and find a number of stones. They had to be grey, almost square, and the size of a cricket ball. Another day came. Akil signed to us to build a fire outside his cave. We made a semicircular wall, scraped out a hollow and laid the fire. First paper with squares written on it, then the special wood, then charcoal, and finally the dried blood of a white goat. The blood had to be powdered and mixed with powdered nutmeg, cinnamon and Hindu incense. For once, Akil spoke. The fire, he said, was to be kept burning for four days without cease. If it went out, the whole performance would have to be repeated. Even the fire itself could not be kindled until the first night of the new moon. Certain things must not happen. One was a jackal's cry, another an owl's hoot. We took turns to sit up all night and stoke the fire. Our horoscopes had to be cast to make sure that there was no inauspicious conjunction which might interfere. Akil laboured long over these. It seemed, however, that all was well. Then the two bowls were taken and placed on a piece of linen about two yards square. This was laid on the ground. Now fifty yards of new cotton were taken and cut into strips one inch wide and laid on the linen. What remained of the clay was mixed with the spring water, carried five miles in a new jar, to the consistency of thick cream. A piece of stone the size of a large apricot was placed in one bowl, with a piece of silver the size of a sugar lump. Over these was spread two tablespoonfuls of the milk sap we had gathered. All the time the gold maker kept looking at the stars, restlessly like a man consulting his watch. He now placed the other bowl on the one containing the stone, silver and juice and formed a kind of circle of the two. The whole thing was then carefully wound round with the long strips of cotton dipped in clay which stuck like glue. This was continued until all the cotton was used up and the mass was greatly enlarged. Lastly, more of the clay, ordinary clay, was moulded round the package and the whole was put into the heart of the glowing fire. Hot charcoal was spread over this, and the vigil began. The bowl had to remain at white heat for seven days and seven nights. Fortunately, it was not necessary to sit over the fire all the time, but we had to keep a constant shared watch over it. This was because Satan cannot make gold, and if this gold in the making were left unwatched, he would come and steal it in its present form and learn the secret. Even Ahmed and I, the uninitiated, had by this time formed the habit of looking anxiously at the stars. Excitement ran high in my mind. Akil crushed that. Every experiment of this nature must be treated as a matter of course. No talk, no laughing, no optimism, no doubt. No eating or drinking on duty. The weary days and nights passed. Akil removed the red ball from the fire and laid it aside in a pile of sand to cool. It took twelve hours to cool sufficiently. Not all the cotton we noticed had burnt due to the presence of the clay as Akil unwrapped it. At long last the bowls were prized apart, and within lay a piece of yellow metal. Akil handed it to me, take it to a jeweller and see if it is gold. When I hesitated, thinking that there must be some trickery, he went into the back of the cave and brought out a large cotton bag. Out of this he turned about fifty other nuggets, just like the one which lay in my hand. These are some, there are many more. I would have doubted once as you doubt. It took me thirty years to learn this. Thirty years of water and nuts, berries and starvation, contemplation and experiment. I had to learn to read the heavens, tame animals, no signs. All I had when I started was a formula which was garbled, and I had to put it right. As to the finding of the places where the right ingredients are, that took years. I asked him what he wanted to do now. Now? It is five years since I perfected the system. 
I have been making gold ever since. I cannot do anything else, and I do not want to. But what is the use of it all? I set at naught all my old master warned me against. It becomes an obsession. The very fact that I can do what none other can, except a few, is my joy, and I do not want anything else. What is the good of gold? Can it restore life? I am its slave. I cannot get away from it. There, my friend, is my story. The fascination has me in its grip. I cannot, will not, give the gold away, sell it, or let anyone else have it. I do not know why this is, either. I took the gold to the jeweller. He offered to buy it. It was not mine. I took it back to Akil. He threw it like a piece of coal into the back of the cave. Go back to London, he said. I have no way of knowing to this day what the answer to all this is. This audio is made available by the Idris Shah Foundation and is copyright 2019. All rights reserved.